One year before the 2020 New Hampshire primary, candidates are already campaigning in the state. So this is great. I am so excited to be here. You know, this is just coming to see our next door neighbors. From the New England News Collaborative, this is Next. We'll look ahead to the big role the Granite State will play in this next year. Plus, we'll travel to Dixville Notch, a tiny town that's clinging to a political tradition, but also taking a closer look at who's on its voter rolls. I was very excited to do so because of, first of all, my right to do so, and the historical value of being first in the nation. And we'll visit a wetland in Vermont and learn about the economic and environmental benefits of the ecosystem. And that ranges from your recreational aspects to your water quality, your obviously your flood storage. We saw that during Irene. Plus, we'll visit an exoneree who's making up for lost time. It's next. Next is powered by the New England News Collaborative, eight public media companies coming together to tell the story of a changing region, with support from the Corporation for Public Broadcasting. I'm John Dankosky. Thanks for joining us. In about one year from today, if you can believe it, New Hampshire voters will participate in the 2020 presidential primary, famous, of course, for its longtime status as being first in the nation. The small state's outsized political role has made it a must-stop for politicians of all levels of popularity, and the list of politicians who've visited the state so far is growing fast, including a few visits from Massachusetts Senator Elizabeth Warren. So this is great. I am so excited to be here, you know. This is just coming to see our next-door neighbors. But this cycle, as other states move their primaries earlier, the role of the New Hampshire primary in the national race might be changing. Here to talk with us is Josh Rogers, NHPR's senior political reporter who follows Granite State politics very closely. Josh, welcome back to Next. Thanks for joining us. Good to be here with you. So, first of all, big picture, why is the New Hampshire primary so important? I mean, the kind of rule of thumb is that there are sort of three tickets out of New Hampshire is the, is the kind of truism that people say, uh, meaning that you need to come in first, second, and third to get on to uh, the next uh, voting states. And, you know, that may have been somewhat true in the past, uh, given the size of the field, given the way that early voting is encroaching on New Hampshire's primacy, given that there's only a week between Iowa and New Hampshire. And now with early voting, there's not much time afterwards when there are going to be huge votes in states like California and you know, Texas and, and, and Massachusetts, um, you know, those are all states, particularly in a Democratic year, that candidates are going to want to win. There are a lot of delegates at stake there. So how, how, how this is all going to play out this year, uh, you know, it's unknown at this point. But, you know, doing well in the New Hampshire primary is certainly something that anyone running for president uh, wouldn't mind doing. Explain a little bit about some of the conventions that candidates have to partake in, the things that you just must do if you're going to be part of the New Hampshire primary, places you have to stop, people you have to talk to. What, is it, what does it look like for, uh, for people who are coming through? Well, whether or not you actually have to do these things, again, is an open question. I mean, traditionally, New Hampshire is a place where it's expected that you'll do some retail campaigning. You'll visit diners. You'll attend house parties. You'll have to stare voters face to face as they ask you questions about matters profound and parochial. And you're expected to uh, demonstrate some sort of authenticity, some sort of ability to connect to voters. You know, the, the subset of voters who actually participate in these things, be it dealing with candidates at a coffee shop or a house party is relatively small. But it is definitely true that the political culture here is such that a voter who wants to go face to face with somebody who might be the next president of the country can do so. And while the fact that all of this plays out on cable TV to the degree that it it may not have a generation ago certainly affects the way everybody acts. But, you know, candidates have to stare voters in the face here. And, um, that's something that you might not get in a bigger state. Did Donald Trump change things forever for New Hampshire in the way that he conducted his campaign in the state last time around? Well, Donald Trump and Bernie Sanders both defied a lot of the sort of truisms about New Hampshire politics and competing in the primary. The the, the kind of beau ideal of, of uh, the primary people think of John McCain. He held, you know, 100 odd town hall meetings the years that, that he won here and would stay and take every question until people were tired out. 
you know, Donald Trump largely skipped that. He spent time in New Hampshire and, you know, had a few events that were small enough to be considered kind of nods at a style of retail politicking. But he held huge rallies. Uh, Bernie Sanders did much the same. Uh, Both of them won easily last time. So whether or not those were kind of one-offs or shape of things to come, we don't know. I mean, this year there are many, many candidates running. And thus far, there's been a lot of traditional New Hampshire-style campaigning. It's obviously very early, but... You know, New Hampshire primary watchers and voters here spend a lot of time, perhaps too much time, evaluating the primary through the lens of, you know, the mythology that's been – the reality and the mythology that that voters here have created about it. And so that's one thing a lot of primary watchers – and there are a lot of people with uh, real, like, sort of vested interests in maintaining the New Hampshire tradition. And that may be people who, you know, have business interests tied to the primary or also just, you know, people who are proud of uh, New Hampshire going first. How is it different when it is Democrats running against an incumbent Republican and you see all of these different sorts of messages than in a year in which you have a bunch of Republicans who are challenging an incumbent Democrat? Does the way in which this primary campaign change at all when you're looking mostly at Democrats than Republicans? Well, it is an open primary. So, um, you know, most voters here are are undeclared or sort of so-called independents. And so, you know, Politicians who run here are hoping to attract candidates in the middle as well as um, as well as the bases of their parties. But I mean, thus far we've been hearing very liberal uh, messages, and that may be the state of the Democratic Party. I mean, there's a there's a generational shift as well that I'm hearing from a lot of voters that that where there's a real appetite for uh, somebody younger than um, somebody who, who's in their 70s. And obviously, you know, Hillary Clinton and Bernie Sanders last time were both. You know, they're both over 70. Um, There are a lot of candidates running this time who are in their 40s and 50s, and a lot of Democratic voters are looking for a generational shift. And a lot of the issues that this younger demographic among the Democrats are talking about are certainly, you know, more liberal than what I've heard in past years from from members of the Democratic Party. Here's a a New Hampshire resident, uh, Arnie Arneson, speaking with NPR's Asma Khalid. I think that it's time for us to start creating a new bench. And the new bench isn't old. It shouldn't be white. It probably shouldn't be male. It's an interesting view, Josh, because you have Bernie Sanders, uh, who obviously uh, very popular in that state from neighboring Vermont. Elizabeth Warren, very popular in the region from neighboring Massachusetts. Two stalwarts of the liberal branch of the Democratic Party. And as you say, this has been a year in which liberals are looking for not necessarily just that voice or those policy proposals, but also for maybe someone who comes from a little bit different background. Are you hearing that from voters? Well, certainly uh, I'm hearing that from a lot of voters. I was talking to somebody the other day who said, you know, my one litmus test for me is, and this was somebody in there, this is somebody who just turned 40. And they said, is if the, if the candidate is somebody who has a child old enough that I could plausibly be friends with them, then they're <laughs> off the table for me. And so that's something I certainly have not heard in the past. I mean, in terms of Sanders and Warren, I mean, one thing that's interesting is that they're obviously both from neighboring states. Um, New Hampshire has traditionally been a friendly place for candidates from neighboring states, uh, regardless of party, uh, be they you know people from Massachusetts or Vermont or Maine, really, and uh, going back a ways. And for Sanders, should he run? And for Elizabeth Warren, I mean, I think I think it's pretty clear that they see New Hampshire as a place that they better do well if they if if they hope to do well in the in the race. Are, are a lot of younger people interested in the New Hampshire primary as the the older voters who maybe cling to this tradition? Because in my mind, one of the reasons that the first the nation primary continues to persist there is because of this deep, deep political tradition. And so many of the younger voters today seem to reject some of these uh, traditional ideas out of hand. I guess I'm wondering, Josh, if if there's in New Hampshire a replacement of this old guard that wants New Hampshire to have this outsized political role, and they're being replaced by younger people who want to be just as politically active in, in a different way. Well, I mean, one thing that's interesting over the weekend, um, last weekend, Sherrod Brown, one of the events he spoke at was a Young Democrats reception, and I went to watch Brown, and I was shocked at the number of people at this uh, event. There were, you know, 400 people there. And Democrats here are feeling pretty good. 2018 was a good year for the party in New Hampshire. You know, our legislature is a citizen legislature full of old people, really. And this year, there were a lot of young people who got elected. There was energy 
among young Democrats that uh, that indicates that you know activists, political activists, are certainly. Um, will probably continue to be excited about the primary, but if you look at some of the policies that that they want, also on you know automatic voting, um, automatic voter registration, uh, potentially uh, vote by mail. I mean, those things are going to be a tough sell culturally uh, in New Hampshire for some. And you know, in a way, the degree we move away from the sort of in face to face, you know, must must register in person sort of culture. Some of the some of the the, the aspects of that have defined the New Hampshire primary, you know, could fade with that as well. So, Josh, before I let you go, I want to ask one other thing. And you've been a political reporter in New Hampshire for a long time. Maybe you could just paint a picture for us, for our listeners, about what it's like to be a political reporter in New Hampshire as you head into such an important uh, election in 2020, as you head into the New Hampshire primary. I mean, give me a sense of the things you're looking at and the things that you care about as you prepare to have this onslaught of people coming through your state. Well, I mean, right now, like what I'm focusing on is just trying to get in the room with these candidates, get a sense of what they're like, get a sense of the, the almost bodily response the crowd has to them, uh, whether or not people are drawn to them, whether or not people are hanging out after they're done talking or whether they're just kind of bolting. You're trying to get a sense of, you know, with so many Democrats running, there's a question about how many local uh, political allies and operatives there are who know New Hampshire well who are hireable or whether they're all kind of off the market. There's that level of scrutiny. And it's also just talking to voters and finding out what they are looking for because there is there is something in this field for most people, Democrats at this point, and you know it's it's hard to keep them it's hard to keep them straight frankly it's hard to it's hard to go to all the events you know right now i'm the main reporter for for we'll we'll kind of farm more of this out to my colleagues but right now you know i'm skipping events every day because there're just so many candidates visiting at this point and you know a year out it's 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 time to get going for these people in such a big field but you know we're a long ways from from knowing who the the voters will gravitate to and you know in talking to voters a lot of them are happy to kick the tires for a long time here there i i've heard very little for like i'm going to vote for elizabeth warren or bernie must absolutely get in the race for me to be satisfied it's going to be a very interesting year for you. I want to thank Josh Rogers, NHPR senior political reporter. Thanks so much, Josh. I really appreciate it. You're welcome, John. One of the primary's many traditions starts right at midnight when the world's attention turns to the tiny north country community of Dixville Notch. Voters in the New Hampshire hamlet of Dixville Notch receive ballot papers ready to cast the first election day votes in the presidential race. Since 1960, voters there have cast their ballots first in the nation. But a recent investigation into Dixville Notch's elections could threaten the future of its midnight voting tradition. For NHPR's State of Democracy project, Casey McDermott reports. As long as you're not camera shy, voting in Dixville Notch comes with plenty of perks. Take Peter Johnson. He cast his ballot there for more than three decades. Whenever he walked out of the voting booth, he walked into a row of reporters eager to hear his take on the race. Republican Peter Johnson said he's looking for someone who can break the gridlock in Washington. And for him, that's Newt Gingrich. Because of his experience, knows how to run the show down there. Dixville Notch isn't the only town that votes at midnight, but they've been doing it the longest, so they get most of the press coverage. Reporters rush to interview Dixville voters like Johnson because they're some of the first people in the whole country country to vote for president. So through the years, Johnson's political commentary has appeared everywhere from CNN to the Sydney Morning Herald. But all of those news stories left out one crucial detail. Peter Johnson doesn't actually live in Dixville Notch. That detail recently came to the attention of state election investigators. Here's Peter again. Last year, I got this letter and we're going to find you X amount of dollars. Peter Johnson's story is complicated. He used to live in Dixville, but that was back in the 1990s. He moved away when his property got tied up in a messy divorce case, but he always intended to go back. He even lined up claim on another property in town. So Dixville is where he kept voting. As long as he only voted once, he didn't think it made any difference where. So I know it doesn't make one damn bit of difference at all. Peter Johnson isn't the only Dixville voter who's gotten a call from state election investigators. The state started digging into his case only after it got several other complaints about Dixville's elections. 
one of those complaints came from a tipster who was watching a news story about Dixville's midnight results. She recognized one of the voters because he lived in her hometown. So the AG's office launched a full investigation into Dixville months after the 2016 general election. Associate Attorney General Ann Edwards says they determined that most of the people who voted in Dixville in 2016 probably should have voted somewhere else. We don't think any of these individuals had any intent to commit voter fraud, but we don't believe these individuals should continue to claim Dixville Notch as their domicile. Some of the voters singled out by the state were people who used to live and work at the Balsams Resort, the main business in Dixville, which closed down in 2011. But the AG's office also raised questions about people who moved to Dixville more recently to work on a project to reopen the old hotel. People like Nancy De Palma, who says she was living part-time in Dixville during the 2016 general election. I was told the day of the election that I could register for Dixville, and I was very excited to do so because of, first of all, my right to do so and the historical value of being first in the nation. The state hasn't charged anyone in Dixville Notch with voter fraud, but election investigators were still pretty alarmed by what they discovered. And this all came as a shock to the guy in charge of Dixville's elections, Tom Tillotson. Dixville's elections have always been absolutely trustworthy. Tillotson's dad helped to launch Dixville's midnight vote. And in that spirit, Tom's goal has always been to encourage people to participate. He didn't see any issue with the people singled out by the AG's office, and he has no regrets about letting them vote in Dixville. There's a level of trust here just because we're so small, everybody knows each other. But Dixville's only getting smaller, and the AG's crackdown isn't helping. In the 2016 election, Dixville had just eight voters. By last fall, the only people left were Tillotson, his wife, his son, and two people working on the project to reopen the Balsams Hotel. That leaves five voters. Well, almost. Actually, Clay just notified me that he is leaving the project. I got a message from him this morning, so we will be down to four by the next election unless somebody comes and replaces him. And that's presented a new and perhaps more existential problem for Dixville Notch. Dixville is running out of people to run its elections. State law requires a certain number of people to check in voters, inspect the ballot box, and more. And Dixville might not make that cutoff. Tillotson says he's hopeful they can make it work for 2020, but he knows time is running out. It's getting to be a ghost town here. (laughs) Whether Dixville has the number of voters it needs to hold an election, that's one thing. Whether the satellite trucks keep showing up to cover an election that's basically just Tillotson and his family, that might be another. For the New England News Collaborative, I'm Casey McDermott. Coming up, we'll meet an exoneree who's putting his life back together after years behind bars. But first, why wetlands matter. It's next. Next is made possible in part by our founding supporters who believe in the power of collaborative news coverage, including the Common Sense Fund supporting the New England News Collaborative and its coverage of climate change and global warming. In a region crisscrossed by so many rivers and streams, wetlands play an enormous role. They provide a unique ecosystem for plants and animals and an important buffer during hurricanes and other natural disasters. But they're also seen as an impediment for those who want to develop on or near them, and the way they're protected could be changing under new EPA rules. We called up Rick Vanderpoel to learn more. He's a certified wetland scientist based in New Hampshire. He explains it all comes down to the way that wetlands are defined. The sort of critical element of the new rule proposal has to do with the hydrologic or water connection between inundated water bodies or saturated water bodies and navigable waters. So in the sort of Clean Water Act list of seven primary types of waters of the United States, the seventh, which discusses wetlands themselves, has had this sort of variably interpreted definition relative to how much they affect the navigable waters, which were part of that original Clean Water Act predecessor, the Rivers and Harbors Act of 1899. 
And if there has to be a surface water connection, then we're going to lose a lot of our isolated wetlands, which in Supreme Court cases in the past have been determined to be valuable, uh, not just for providing um, chemical or biological or physical connections to wetlands, but also for migratory birds. And so right now, we've got this zone that allows uh, waters that are intermittent or ephemeral, but nonetheless have this sort of chemical, physical, or biological nexus to navigable waters to be covered as waters of the United States. The proposed rule would take some of that away. According to the EPA's acting administrator, Andrew Wheeler, the change aims to provide states and landowners the certainty they need to manage their natural resources and grow local economies. But we asked Vanderpoel, what is at stake here? That rule change would allow, I should say, would take away the federal oversight of these isolated waters and allow developers to uh, go in and uh, use those lands, those swamplands, marshlands that are uh, not necessarily inundated 100% of the time or connected to navigable waters and use those for, for development. And, of course, this will you know, lessen the flood storage capacity. It will have impacts on wildlife habitat, and it will have impacts on the groundwater recharge values that wetlands currently serve. So there's, a, there's sort of a, a huge amount of, of land that's at stake here that are de facto protected through regulation from development. Even if national rules change, states still have a lot of power in protecting these ecosystems. Take Vermont, for example. Vermont's largest wetland area stretches 15 miles along the Otter Creek in Addison and Rutland counties. The area is richly diverse, and it hosts rare plant and animal species. The wetlands also serve as a giant sponge capable of absorbing floodwaters. VPR's John Dillon reports that in the midst of the Trump administration's proposed changes, local groups are talking to the state about how to provide greater protection for the Otter Creek wetlands. A wetland in winter can be a very welcoming place. One, it's easier to walk, actually. And two, there are no mosquitoes right now. (laughs) (laughs) People think we're kind of nuts for going out in places like this during mosquito season. (laughs) That's Mark Lappin, a professor of environmental studies from Middlebury College and a member of the Cornwall Conservation Commission. We've met up with three people from the state wetlands program who want to get a close look at these wetlands in winter. And because the water is frozen, we won't need to battle bugs or wear waders, just snowshoes. There are many types of wetlands, bogs, fens, marshes, and swamps. The things that really matter in wetlands are how high the water gets, how low the water drops, how high peat builds up, and if there's water movement that brings oxygen and nutrients. And so there's amazing complexity in here with those factors, and a lot of it's related to what's happening underneath the ground. As we meander through alder shrubs and around green ash trees, Lappin challenges ecologists Tina Heath and Charlie Hone to identify what looks to me like a bare twig poking out of the snow. Here's another one for your winter botany skills. The one we were just looking at. Uh, Ooh, dead plant ID. That's our favorite. The Eliza Machia. That's what I, I wondered so. about, too. Oh, oh, is it one of the nettles? Uh, false nettles. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It is false. Bomeria oh, Bomeria. Uh, yes. The 3,500-acre Cornwall Swamp is within the state wildlife management area, which means it's pretty much protected from development. But that's not true of the entire Otter Creek wetland complex, which is sort of what we refer to, you know, from Middlebury down to Brandon. Zapata Courage is a state district wetland ecologist for Addison, Rutland, and part of Bennington counties. She's working with local conservation commissions and other interested groups on the first steps to what could be greater protections for more of the 1,500-acre Otter Creek complex. As a, an entire wetland, it provides all 10 functions and values that have been identified as being important to protect in the state of Vermont. And that ranges from your recreational aspects to your water quality, your obviously your flood storage. We saw that during Irene. In 2011, Irene pummeled the state with heavy rain, causing widespread flooding in river valleys. But here, the Otter Creek spilled over into the surrounding floodplain and wetlands, which soaked up the surge. Middlebury was mostly spared. UVM did a study 
to look at if the volume and velocity that was experienced in Brandon had been maintained all the way through to Middlebury, what would have been the resulting damage? And the calculation was $1.8 million. So there's clearly an economic value to these wetlands. They also filter and clean the waters that drain into Otter Creek. They provide a home for rare species like the endangered Indiana bat. Mark Lappin says the wetlands serve as nature's reservoirs for biodiversity as the climate changes and invasive pests spread across the landscape. There's a butternut behind us, a dead butternut. So there used to be a lot of butternut in this uh, forest along Otter Creek, and that's another one that's been lost to disease, the butternut canker. So we've already basically lost elm and butternut, and we're about to lose ash from this ecosystem. There's a lot of stresses on our forests. All of the Otter Creek complex is defined as a state class two wetlands, which means they're protected with a 50-foot buffer and permits are required for development within the wetlands. There's some movement to reclassify all or part of the complex as class one wetlands, which expands the buffer to 100 feet. Development would be allowed only if there's a compelling need to protect public health and safety. Under either classification, farming and forestry are still permitted within the buffers. Lappin is a member of the Cornwall Conservation Commission, which has started talking about the Class I protection. He calls the wetlands an oasis of diversity. This swamp, except for these few fields along the edge where it's better drained, has never been cleared. So the, the biodiversity in here is it's not even known yet. And we value that. Without a state rule, wetlands regulation defaults to the federal government. Zapata Courage, the district wetlands ecologist, says the community focus on the wetlands is happening as the Environmental Protection Agency, under President Trump, has moved to roll back federal wetlands protections. The Otter Creek complex spans several towns and involves multiple landowners. Courage says the discussions about reclassifying are at a very early stage. This may never get beyond this stage, right? It it might not. It may be an overwhelming process. And that's fine. The fact that these conversations are even happening to begin with, that the questions are being asked, that there is a level of recognition of the value of the wetlands within their communities is occurring, that itself is a win. And the community work continues as town conservation commissions consider what to do next to conserve the Otter Creek wetlands. For the New England News Collaborative, I'm John Dillon. Given proposed rule changes that could threaten wetlands protections, it is interesting to see a big bipartisan effort at the federal level to conserve land and provide protections for our region's rivers. More than 65,000 miles of river run throughout New England, many of those heavily populated and industrialized, like the Connecticut River. But only about 360, or less than 1% of those miles, have achieved a rare national distinction, wild and scenic. These are rivers designated by Congress as having a special natural and cultural importance. The newly passed Senate bill would add the wild and scenic designation to sections of the Nashua River in Massachusetts and New Hampshire, sections of the Lower Farmington River and Salmon Brook River in Connecticut, and sections of the Wood Pocketuck Watershed in Rhode Island and Connecticut. The bill is expected to go to the House later in February. Last year, Connecticut Public Radio's Patrick Scahill took us out on one of the rivers that already has that designation, the Eight Mile in southeastern Connecticut. Here's the story. The trees are dense, the path is narrow, and everywhere there's the sound of water. I hike to a clearing and hear it dashing against rocks below, clouds of mist wafting over my trail. This is Devil's Hopyard State Park, a place I've always thought had one of New England's more unique names. So I asked my guide, Rob Smith, where it came from. I mean, there's lots of different tales. Smith was a park manager here for about 10 years, and he says the mist coming off the falls can get a little spooky. They attributed the potholes to the devil as he was coming up, climbing up over the rocks here, getting his tail wet and his cloven hoofs as he leaped from place to place going up the falls created these potholes. Today, Smith and I are exploring a part of the park where the Eight Mile River runs through. It's a watershed that's 40,000 acres of forests, fields, and fast-flowing cool rivers. It's a beautiful spot. So pristine that in 2008, Congress designated parts of the area wild and scenic. 
one of only 10 spots in New England to carry that title. Why wild and scenic? This area isn't on the way to any place. Tony Irving is one of the many volunteers who worked to get that designation, and he says the eight miles distance from cities like Hartford and New Haven kept the area looking like Connecticut would have before Europeans settled here. So it was sort of an area that didn't really get developed at all. Sort of, because there was some development, just not much. As we hop in a car and travel from the 8 Miles' western branch to its eastern side, Irving and Smith explain how colonists had a lot of trouble farming here. The soil was rocky, which made it hard for villages to expand, and when the west opened up, populations dropped. Still, as I learned a few miles later, some families stuck it out. We're walking down what was the original road through here. David Bingham says his family's history on this land in Salem goes back to the mid-1700s. As we walk down an old path toward a century-old bridge, that history is alive, pillared in nearby sugar maples which tower above New Forest. You can see along the old road here, you can see the large trees, which were once the shade trees for the road itself. And uh, so this would have been the main thoroughfare when my father was young. As we talk, a tiny winged visitor interrupts us. Let me a little back. bug on your neck here. Let me, there we go. Don't worry about it. <laughs> That's... Uh, Damsel fly. It, Very pretty. It's actually yeah. fun to watch them come, and they actually slap the water in the stream. Bingham points out wildlife. There are state-listed rare plants, which help the area get its wild and scenic title. There are invasives, which present new challenges. And then there's just the beauty. As we talk, a turkey vulture soars overhead, and between the natural sounds and flowing water, it's hard to leave. But Tony Irving has a schedule to keep. He's eager to show off the river. Okay, we're on to our next spot, which is going to be the Edville's Pond Dam. In the car, I tell Irving I actually visited this spot back in 2015. Back then, the 80-year-old Edville's Dam was holding back a lot of water, creating a big pond in the river, which Irving says sat unshaded, baking in sunlight. It was literally warming up the rest of the river. That was bad news for fish like trout, which prefer the 8 miles colder water. So, conservancy groups took the dam out and basically rebuilt this part of the river, using old photos to see how it flowed and recreating its path with rocks and other guiding pieces of armor. Just sort of talk the river into saying, yeah, you remember this? You remember this? Well, we're going to just help you remember a little bit more by putting a little armor here to help direct that water flow. Water which flows down to where the east and west branches of the Eight Mile River converge, what's called the river's main stem. Now, we're at the end of our journey. A short car ride takes us to a dam and an old mill that's really close to the terminus of the river. We're near Hamburg Cove, where the Eight Mile dumps into the Connecticut River, about eight miles north of Long Island Sound. That's where the Eight Mile gets its name. Irving lives nearby. He moved here a while back, and he's never stopped appreciating the river. Oh, this is my church. It really is my church giving him a spiritual connection and, he says, an ecological one, a diverse array of wildlife and habitat, all of which combine to make the Eight Mile River wild, scenic, and maybe a little mystical. For the New England News Collaborative, I'm Patrick Scahill in Hartford. Coming up, how much should the state pay you for 30 years behind bars wrongfully convicted? It's next. Next is made possible in part by our founding supporters who believe in the power of collaborative news coverage, including the John Merck Fund, supporting the New England News Collaborative and its coverage of climate and clean energy. In November of 2017, we presented an investigation by Jennifer McKim of the New England Center for Investigative Reporting about the difficulties wrongfully convicted people face as they try to get compensation from a state that put them behind bars, sometimes for decades. Most states have some sort of law that allows the wrongfully convicted to file for compensation, including every New England state except Rhode Island. The amount of compensation ranges widely from the state of Vermont, where a person can receive between $30,000 and $60,000 for each year in prison, to New Hampshire, which caps the total award at $20,000. 
When we talked to Jennifer McKim, a 2004 law was still on the books in Massachusetts that capped an award for wrongful conviction at $500,000. But she told us that because of a needlessly complicated system, very few exonerees have benefited. 67 people have filed for it. Less than half have got it. The average payout is about $364,000, and um, it takes forever. She introduced us to Victor Rosario, who was wrongly convicted of an arson in Lowell, Mass., in 1982 and was in prison until his sentence was overturned in 2014. Uh, it's no money in this, in, in this uh, whole entire world that they can pay even for one day to be a wrongful conviction. Uh, I don't think so. I, I, I not believe that, you know, because if you look at it, you know, all the things that has happened into my life, uh, beginning with the loss of my mother, beginning with the loss of my father, beginning with the loss of my children, then I never grow up with them. They never grow up with me. Uh, you know, I met my daughter or after almost 36 years, I met my daughter some of them two months ago, and we have a reunion together. You know, you, you can tell me, you know, see, see that amount can pay for, at least for that. You know, uh, it's, not, it's not money. It's the, the, the system needs to be changed. That's what it is. The system needs to be changed, and this thing not continue to happen. Last year, one part of that system did change. The cap for an award for wrongful conviction in Massachusetts went up to $1 million. But the change came too late for the man we'll meet next. Mark Shand wrongfully spent almost three decades in Massachusetts prisons, five years after a judge vacated his conviction, and a year after a hard-fought settlement from the government, he's making up for lost time. As New England Public Radio's Karen Brown reports, Shand is now opening a chain of smoothie restaurants in Connecticut. From his prison cot for 27 years, Mark Shand plotted out a retail empire he'd been envisioning since well before his arrest. I would like lay in the bed, my eyes wide open, looking at the ceiling, just thinking of color scheme and picture the uniform, you know. And he'd also imagine eating and serving something other than prison slop. The food in there is atrocious. I mean, everything is dehydrated or, or, you know, just try to stay away from the processed stuff that they sold you in the commissary. Which may explain why today, a free man at 54, he's a devotee to fitness and nutrition. Jazzy, what's the name of this? What's doing is this? Berry Fresh? Okay. And why his new chain of smoothie bars called Sweetwater advertises only fresh ingredients. I often brag that if we got no oil, sugar, or butter, we don't cook with it, we don't use it, we don't have any here. Shand opened this new Britain, Connecticut cafe a year ago. The mayor cut the ribbon. At first, Shan says customers came out of curiosity about his backstory, but now they come for the healthy shakes. How are you, sir? I'm about five pounds, man. Since two old, yeah. Is that right? Yeah, man. Thanks to yeah. that guy. See that? There you go. Good stuff. This business stuff. is meant to reboot a career, Shand says, was stolen from him at the age of 19. In the months before he was arrested, he'd been preparing to open his first clothing store. And, and I signed a lease. I got my LLC. Had I not been locked up, where would I be now? Shand always insisted he was nowhere near the 1986 nightclub shooting in Springfield, Massachusetts, that killed a 25-year-old bystander. In 2013, new evidence convinced a judge to let him go. But as an exoneree, Shand did not qualify for job training, tuition help, or other reentry services offered to people on parole. So he had to take jobs in manual labor at UPS and a gun manufacturer. And he got tired of the long hours dictated by a boss. It wasn't exactly the same as prison, but it wasn't different enough. Plan on never working for another person again if I could help it, you know. But to start his own business, he needed money. And he says no bank would give him a loan. He's filed a civil lawsuit against the cities of Springfield and Hartford. But that could take years. That left his only recourse, a state statute that allows compensation to those wrongfully convicted. When Shand was released, the maximum was half a million dollars. They made it as much work and trouble as they could. Springfield lawyer John Thompson has represented Shand for decades. After Shand got out, Thompson thought the state would right its wrong without a fuss. But he says the Massachusetts Attorney General's office fought against the payout from the get-go. The Attorney General's office has been litigating these and forcing people to go two, three, four years out of prison before they can get anything. 
But Attorney General Maura Healey says the legal process takes a long time because it's designed to be adversarial. She says her office has no choice but to defend the state against the exoneree. Some might look and say, well, if the court decided to release this person, then Commonwealth, why don't you just write the check? But the statute only permits recovery if that person has established, has proved actual innocence. This is common in many states. On the one hand, legislators agree that courts make mistakes. But they don't want to pay people who only got out on a technicality. So exonerees have to go back to court for compensation. Healy says she would like the Massachusetts legislature to create a whole different system for wrongful convictions, one set up as a simple claim process, not a legal fight. I am sure that Mr. Shan would have liked to have seen recovery sooner. Um, I can't imagine what it's like to have lost 27 years of my life, but we have to follow what the current process is under the law. Since Mark Shan's case, and partly because of it, future exonerees will have it somewhat better. We found that the law wasn't working the way we expected it to. State Senator Patricia Jalen helped write the compensation law in 2004, and last year she helped rewrite it as part of the Massachusetts criminal justice overhaul. The wrongfully convicted still have to prove their innocence, but the cap on restitution was doubled to a million dollars. Plus, they get job training, health care, and other services. Their claims are supposed to be fast-tracked in the court system, and the state pays attorney's fees. It'll be more likely that attorneys would be willing to accept a case that might require a lot of work if they're going to get attorney's fees separate from the compensation they get for their client. The changes came too late for Mark Shand. When his case finally settled in 2017, he accepted $50,000 less than the maximum. After he paid his lawyer, he got $300,000, which comes to about $11,000 per year of incarceration. But that was enough for him to buy a rental property and to pay startup costs for his smoothie business. An infrigerator, stove, blender, big freezer in the back. uh, When I told Shand, he strikes me as a good example of why states have these compensation statutes, to give someone the means to start over after years behind bars. He expressed a rare moment of bitterness. No, 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 no. State, no. 100 percent, no. I, I disagree with that. Frankly, he says, it's no one's business what exonerees do with their money. This is not a start-over grant. It's a moral debt. They should be compensated because they've wronged you. And they they can't give you your years back. So the fact that they yanked me and incarcerated me for 30 years, the money they gave me means nothing. Today, Shand is relying on his own business acumen more than any state assistance. Last September, he opened a second smoothie location in Hartford, tucked in the corner of a noisy deli. On opening day, his grandchildren were giving out free samples, and his youngest son, Quentin, was on hand. Quentin was in utero when Shand went to prison. Now 31, he's passing out flyers to advertise the shop. I pretty much handed out a stock, I don't know, maybe like two, three hundred of these to individual people. Hopefully they come, so. If all goes well, Shand hopes to open a third smoothie location. Eventually, he'd like to hire ex-inmates, the innocent and the guilty. But the first men he tried to help just didn't make good enough smoothies. you got to make sure the product is right or the customer base will be gone. They, you know, if smoothie people, are, they finicky. If they smoothie ain't right, they're out of here. And i got, I got to protect the business. I can't, you know. When a new customer comes in for the opening, Shand offers to make his favorite smoothie. It's called the Linda and John Thompson, in honor of the lawyers who helped get him out of prison. It is the freshest thing. Pineapple, green apple, ginger... He pours the thick liquid in a large plastic cup and lets it almost overflow beyond the dome lid. He hands it to his five-year-old granddaughter. Here you go. Be careful. Wait a minute. Use two hands. Come on. Say, here you go. Thank you. Say, you're welcome. And with that, Mark Shand swings open the piece of plywood that leads out of the kitchen nook and apologizes for rushing off. He's late to meet a realtor for what could be his next business venture, a downtown sports bar. For the New England News Collaborative, I'm Karen Brown. For many people, the experience of getting an education is full of small moments that make a big impact. WBUR's Edify Desk is exploring those deeply personal stories in a series called Lessons Learned. 
Jose Bo brings us back to an experience he had while serving a 12-year prison sentence. I wasn't a bad kid. I was just very hyperactive. And, you know, I got it to the point where I, where I would rather smoke weed all day with my friends and hang out than go to school. In a place where, frankly, I didn't feel, you know, like I, I belonged. My crimes were always economic. Some of my first crimes were, like, just going into, like, Kmart and stealing pants and a shirt because I didn't have clothes. And I felt embarrassed. And then I remember, like, I hurt my dad or something, like, I think I stole some checks from him and, and I just remember like the feeling of it and his disappointment. So I moved up in career and I decided, well, I'm not going to be a thief. I still need money. I can sell drugs. So I was incarcerated for drug trafficking and I was, um, you know, all of 23 at the time, 20 years ago now. It's crazy to think. And, you know, I had gotten into an altercation with another uh, gentleman and went to isolation for 30 days. Today I think differently, but at the time I felt like you're not going to do this to me. I'm not going to allow you to turn me into an animal. I'm not going to allow you to turn me into like this ex-con quote. I'm going to be normal when I get out. And what does that mean? So I started reading. I started learning French. And I was just supremely lucky that in the state of Massachusetts there was this one prison where they had college. Be you. It's like being released every day. Um, the teachers who came in were kind. They weren't scared of us. They weren't. They didn't buy into the fact that we were animals. I think at least not. They didn't show that. Dr. Baker. Um, she was. Um, she taught us mu- history of music. And um, when I got to her test, she played uh, like a, a thirty seconds of music. And I wrote on two pa- two white line papers back and forth. Both sides were full, and I handed it to her. And I remember putting, like, details that really had nothing. Like, this guy's second cousin was a baron of, like, whatever, and, you know, he had 14 wives. Her reaction kind of threw me off. She was so impressed, and she had, she mentioned to me, like, I've taught at Columbia. And I had heard of Columbia, right? She's like, I taught at Columbia, and I've never, you know, I've never seen that. And she wrote me this beautiful letter of, of recommendation. And it said I was going to graduate with honors, and she was right. Um, so I was always appreciative of her seeing that. I think being in a position where people, and you included, have been telling you how bad you are for so long that to know that's not always true um, gave me an energy that I took through the rest of the college career. I ended up being valedictorian. In the graduation, you can hug your families, you can walk around with them. It was a really open time um, that was almost unheard of any other time besides now. You know, I remember sitting on my on my bunk and running my fingers over the raised ink and saying, "Oh, this is real." It was the first time I had finished anything. You know, I had. you know, I had quit relationships, I had quit on society, I had quit on myself and family and um, for so long that um, finishing this degree really changed me. Call it what you want, luck, you know, the, the universe, you know, but I feel like I'm, I'm where I'm supposed to be. Jose Bo now works with Holyoke Public Schools helping to reduce chronic absenteeism and coordinate student families with school leaders. Lessons Learned is produced by WBUR Edify reporter Carrie Young. You can find more at our website, nextnewengland.org. You can also find our show wherever you get your podcasts. Just search for Next New England. And if you like what you hear, be sure to rate and review us on iTunes. Next is produced by Lily Tyson. The executive producer is Katie Talarski, and the digital producer is Carlos Mejia. We had help this week from Jonathan McNichol and Andrew Perella. Our theme music is by composer Todd Merrill. You can hear more of his music at toddmerrill.com. Thanks also to Goodnight Blue Moon for their song, New England. The New England News Collaborative is funded in part by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting with support from Douglas Stone and Mary Schwab Stone through the Smart Family Foundation of New York and the Melville Charitable Trust. 
It's powered by WBUR Boston, Vermont Public Radio, New Hampshire Public Radio, Maine Public Radio, The Public's Radio, WSHU Public Radio Group, New England Public Radio, and Connecticut Public Radio.